moderator is Greg, who is very, very well known. He is the president of the uh, Nigerian Ship Owners Association. He's very active. Uh, for those who know anything about Nigeria, he's very, very known. And I think this topic uh, is in very good hands. Greg, the podium's yours. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to start by thanking the organizers of this wonderful summit uh, for inviting me to come from, um, if you like, a developing nation uh, to participate in an event that is principally for the European Union. With all the attendant uh, high technology, uh, high uh, standards of uh, regulation compliances, and for me, it's a humbling learning opportunity. So thank you very much, John, and your team for a good job you're doing. Um, this, after, this morning, we are going to attempt to do justice to the topic of our session, which is the development in the ports to cater for innovative ships. And to uh, do justice to this topic, I have some very uh, respectable, distinguished personalities who have made their mark in their respective uh, industries and callings uh, starting with a gentleman who I read up about, and I'm very humbled by his uh, accomplishments. I'm talking about uh, Robert Yuxel Yildirim. Uh, Robert is the president and CEO of the Yildirim Holdings, uh, a renowned ports owner all over Europe, um, and has a lot of investments uh, made in several ports. I'm sure he will have a lot of contribution to make in the course of this uh, discussion. Uh, second is none other but Dr. Raphael von Heermann, who is the Secretary General of Cruise Lines. Robert, you're welcome. And of course, my friend, uh, Mohamed Zaitoum, uh, those of you who were at the last session you saw that he did a lot of justice to his uh, topic, and I'm sure he will have a lot to say to us with respect to the subject. We now have uh, Evangelos, yes, Evangelos Chazidianis, uh, who is a renowned trader uh, responsible for recycling uh, coordination uh, in GMS. The last but not the least is my friend Francesco uh, Laro, a, a, a renowned lawyer in Italy, uh, who was one time also the president of the uh, Port of Naples. Gentlemen, you are welcome. Um, before we go on, I will want to vary the mode of this uh, session slightly from what we've been used to. Um, but I would like to make it very, very audience uh, interactive. And to do that, I want to start with the, a question which will be scored. Um, Rebecca, uh, please, you can uh, get ready for the question. I'm going to read the questions that we're going to start with for audience participation before we come to the panel. The question is this. What is an innovative ship? Because many of us have our own perceptions, ideas, and views of what an innovative ship should be. And um, some people say, well, it is a ship that meets current environmental requirements. Others say that it is a ship that meets global cargo transportation requirements. And the last group think it's one that takes into consideration 
the ship owner's commercial uh, interests and also environmental consideration. I'll go through that again. What is an innovative ship? Time is ticking, we have just two minutes to answer that. Uh, is it a ship that meets current environmental requirements? Is it a ship that meets global cargo transportation requirements? Or one that takes into consideration uh, the owner's commercial interests and environmental consideration? So we have about 40 seconds to go if you score in on your app. We'll be calling up for the answer a little later on. Now, whilst you are doing that, permit me to share my views on the subject that we are treating at this session. We all know that it has long been stated that the world trade is the engine that drives civilization. The closing 100 years of the second millennium have seen world trade grow astonishingly. With this growth, not only have trade patterns and the types of cargoes changed radically, but the ships that carry the goods have also changed almost beyond recognition. Today's cargo handling methods bear not the slightest resemblance to what had been there before. Innovative ships have been the major key to the change creating concepts such as containerization, intermodalism, and globalization. The net effect of market forces has been to change technology in the development of increasingly economic methods of moving cargo. In respect to this, engineers have responded by devising entirely new vessel types and expanding the frontiers of deadweight tonnage and speed. The result has been an ocean transportation system that is able to carry the vastly increased amount of cargo swiftly and also safely. These technological and commercial breakthrough have also resulted in port development to cater to the needs of these new innovations. Taking the container ship as a case study, it is easy to see how the advent of the container ship has revolutionized port operations and hence its development. The pioneering container ships could carry, if you remember, only about 59 containers having a length of about 35 feet and stacked too high on deck. Once this seemingly radical idea of carrying boxes by ship had been proven sufficiently in the coastwise trade, the first true container ships having cellular holes into which containers were loaded by cranes came into being. The capacity was around 200 TEU, the designation being the standard measurement of capacity adopted by the industry, as you all know. For several years, designs have been available for vessels with capacities of up to about 15,000 TEU. The design and construction of such vessels is well within the state of the art, in fact, a consensus among shipbuilders and ship operators is that a container ship able to load 20,000 TEU may well be a possibility. Now, the highest currently standing at about 18,270 TEU <coughs> at the moment. For such a ship to become a viable reality, may require a complete rethinking on the, of the way containers are handled to and from the ship, as well as to and from within the port or the shoreside terminals. Of equal or greater importance, there must be shoreside facilities to match its capacity and type. 
Today's container ship is the linchpin of cargo transportation, but it's, not, it's only a part of the total system which includes sophisticated shoreside terminals, intermodal extensions to inland points by rail, highway, and automated information system that track a shipment twice journey. Now, other innovations include the Arctic Shuttle Tankers, a mega ship which incorporates an icebreaker and a shuttle tanker, innovative cruise ships, not to mention others such as the LNG, which we've been talking about today. You have the iron ore, the, uh, the requiring innovations in the ports, which would include the type of handling equipment, the, the power supply, uh, to name a few. The required development of the ports that will cater to the many challenges innovative ships raise is what Mr. Robert, uh, your dream, Dr. Raphael, um, friend Mohammed, Evangelos, and of course Francesco will be speaking on to us this afternoon. Um, before we go to the uh, panelists who will soon take over, can I invite Rebecca if the results of the question are ready? If you can put that up, please. Rebecca. Okay. As you can see, one that takes into consideration the owner's commercial interests and environmental uh, requirements appears to be the most popular. And that makes a lot of sense because those of us who are ship owners, that's really where our interest lies. Thank you very much for those of you who participated in that. At this point, I want to invite uh, the panelists to take just two minutes to introduce themselves to the audience and uh, tell us briefly their name, what they do, so that you can have a focus as to what to expect from them and also what type of question you're going to throw to Robert. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I am the president and CEO of Yildirim Group. Uh, Yildirim Group is located in Turkey in 11 sectors. Our main activities in the groups are metals and mining, port management, and uh, fertilizer energy. These are the locomotives. Then we have shipping, coal and coal, real estate development, private equity arm, and others. Today I'm here in Malta because I feel that Malta is my second home because I'm one of the biggest investors in Malta. I have the 50% shares in Malta Freeport with CMA, CGM's terminal link. And uh, the reason I attend uh, today's uh, panel, uh, because of our investment in the port operations and management, Yield Port Holding today uh, operating 21 terminals globally. We are the fastest growing port operator in the world by the Drury's uh, terminal operators league table. This year we were number 15 in the world. So the, our aim to become the one of the top 10 terminal operators. So I would like to tell what Yieldport makes the, this business different than others and is seeing the future for the uh, mega ship handling in the ports and makes the innovative uh, port operations and to make the port business more the profit center rather than the cost center. So thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. Uh, can I invite Dr. Raphael now to please introduce himself to the audience? Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you 
to the, uh, to the organizers to invite me. It's a pleasure to be here in Malta. My name is Raphael von Heeremann. I'm the Secretary General of CLIA, Cruise Line International Associations. We are a global association with different branch offices, and I'm heading the branch office in Europe. So globally, we are representing more than 90% of the cruise industry. Cruise, cruising is a fascinating business. If you see right now, we have uh, increasing figures. And what is important for us right now that we comply with all the highest environmental standards because the key, the key of our business model is the environment. We need a safe and a secure and healthy environment in order to operate in these seas. So for us, it's, it, it's, it's very important to, as I said before, to comply with the highest uh, environmental standards. So we are right now shifting. We have one, several members of CLEAR right now have ordered the latest technology regarding LNG. So one of the members is operating right now an LNG, an LNG engine, but uh, fueled from the, from the shore. And uh, we have also advanced wastewater treatment in order to comply with MAPOL 4 so when it comes to the special area. And what we are also doing is we, are, we have more than 12 recycling streams on board, so we are trying to recycle all the different uh, wastes we are producing on board. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Mohammed. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Mohammed Zaitoun. I'm the head of new building technical project in United Arab Shipping Company. Um, I would like to describe the meaning of innovation or innovated ships. Uh, so I would like to uh, talk about it after my colleagues so I can have more time, sufficient time to talk about it. The description of innovation ships and what is the meaning of innovation ships from our perspective. Yes, um, uh, good afternoon again uh, from my side as well. Uh, my name is Vangelis Hadzijanis. Um, I'm working as a trader with CMS, uh, the world's largest uh, cash buyer of ships for recycling. Um, uh, basically, through the establishment of the company until today, um, we have taken over, over 3,000 uh, vessels uh, for recycling, either on uh, delivered or as is where basis. And uh, some of them uh, we keep on trading, and uh, others are just, just for recycling. So uh, we deal with uh, a lot of ports in the taking over procedures, and um, I'm here to uh, share our experience basically with uh, taking over different ports and how uh, different types of vessels uh, can affect um, a smooth uh, taking over process and uh, discharging procedure. Evangel, uh Francesco, please. Yes, my name is Francesco Lauro, and uh, I'm an Italian uh, shipping lawyer and M&A lawyer. I'm the first one of my family among, after some centuries who is not involved in ship owning, but I assist ship owners and other uh, shipping entrepreneurs as a lawyer. In the 90s, I was president of the Port Authority of Naples. Naples is the largest uh, Italian city uh, on the sea, and this was an experience that was very challenging and very interesting. I think <coughs> I devoted the best of my uh, talent. At that time I was not yet uh, 40 years old. Uh, the, why this was a challenging experience? Not only because I worked for my own community and city, but also because the port of Naples, as many Italian, but also not Italian, I would say Mediterranean ports, is a historical port and uh, has got uh, various uh, uh, industries, various type of trades, uh, and has got the Naples area, has got the highest demographic pressure in Europe, and probably the second highest after Hong Kong and Shanghai area in the world. So a lot of problems that we will deal with today are uh, enhanced by this um, uh, very fragile, delicate, uh, monumental old city. It was founded by Greek columns, then we had Romans up to the modern times. 
but also by this democratic pressure and the conflict of interest that you have got among all these things. So innovative vessels, uh, as you, Mr. Chairman, I think there are many definitions of innovative uh, vessels, but I think one of the definitions is that uh, to be able uh, to cope and to fit not only environmentally, but uh, with the port and with the land. And if I have uh, my another uh, uh, opportunity, I, I will uh, tell you some a couple of very uh, interesting uh, facts that happened during my experience with port that I think will amuse also part of the audience here. Very good. Uh, Francesco, I like the style, that, the idea that you did your introduction and went straight into addressing some of the issues that had to do with your uh, port experience in Naples. Um, I want to come back to uh, Robert. Your introduction is quite intimidating. It's not limited to uh, Malta, it's not limited to Europe, it's more or less global. Uh, how have you been able to cope with the changing needs uh, of the port infrastructure resulting from the type of ships that you're having to visit your ports? Thank you, Chairman. Maybe I just give the little background how I started the port business. Uh, when I was young, after my studies in the United States, I was doing my PhD, and I got a job offer, uh, Japanese Mitsui Group, to work in their uh, crane company called Paseco in California. So I worked five years as a mechanical engineer and designing the gantry cranes, and rubber tire gantry cranes, ship to shore cranes, spreaders, all these, and work on the terminal rehabilitation in late 80s, early 90s. Then I returned to Turkey. After working and uh, making some uh, money, uh, I was always looking for a port investment. So when I started my very little port investment in Turkey, actually it was a very old shipyard. They tried to convert the container terminal, but there was no success. It was 30,000 TU uh, old port. So I took it over and I start making my innovative things to make a boutique terminal. And then there was limitations in Turkey. Ships are crossing the Dardanelles and Bosphorus 300 meters. So the, I was just planning to make the port accommodate the ships up to 300. Then suddenly the, the ship orders change. So innovation started in the container shipping. Actually, innovation was not for environmental friendly or the things they were going to make faster ships and bigger ships. So they can carry more cargo much faster. So suddenly, jumbolizing the size, and there was a cascading in the size of the ships, so changing the port. So from that moment, I start thinking, if I make a port investment, it is not for today's need. It needs to be for the decades, like 10, 20 years future you need to consider, because Industry is so competitive, and size of the ships are changing so fast. So we designed the terminal, and then the 2009 crisis happened, and then the, we entered the, uh, basically the acquisition market, where I can find opportunities to acquire ports, but then we invested in CMA CGM. They were in uh, financial difficulties. And 2011 January, we became the investor in CMA. So the, that opened a new chapter in our port growth because we have the information of the container industry. And also, I have appetite 
to grow in the ports. So putting these two to create the synergy for our growth. So that's how the yield port story started actually from 2011. So 2011 to 2016, in five years, we came from nowhere to the number 15 in the world by the Drury. So, and my aim to, to make the, this business different than the existing port operators, because if you look at the today's in the container terminal operations, you have one just the operators and the ones that container liners. Container liners like Maersk, MSC, CMA, Chinese and others, they all have their own ports, terminals. They use it for their own ship service, basically give the service to their ships and carry the all the profits with the boxes with their ships so the ports are working only cost center for them and then the other category is the terminal operators like dp world hutchison and ictsi psa so i'm in that category but i'm so small they're so big so i said i have to create a success story in my uh, storybook, so I can get financing from the banks, I can get attention from the existing port owners, either states or the families or whoever. So that's why I called Yield Port Holdings Growth Strategy under the name of Game Changer. When I say the game changer, industry was criticizing, what is this? But today they understood, because we are looking at the ports mainly with the multipurpose, because there are so many kinds of business handling in the ports, but the main operators today focus on the container terminals, so they were only seeing the either black or white, but we see the uh, rainbow, all the color, all kind of things and how to interchange the commodities from container to the bulk or liquid or liquid bulk to the container. So the, we created our own business plan, growth strategy, and we start presenting this and we got a great attention from the many port owners who were planning the exit. So. As soon as we get into the, these negotiations, our aim was always thinking for future, so we explain our business model in the terminal for handling the future ships, innovative ships. Innovative ships meaning is larger, longer, wider, deeper, so ports need a lot of investment, not only in the infrastructure, because the Ports are built long time ago, so they need uh, infrastructure to improve, to handle the bigger cranes, and you need a bigger uh, draft to handle the big ships, and you need a bigger cranes to handle the wider and longer ships, and you need the automation in the gate side, you need the automation in the yard side, you need to improve the productivity, so all these things. So the, my education in the US, when I studied late 80s with the automation, computer-aided design, manufacturing, expert system, artificial intelligence, so all these things give me how to create my success story for my business plan. So that's how the yield port growth becomes so aggressive and very uh, strong and fast. For example, in Malta, when I came to Malta November 2011, about the 50% of the Malta free terminal, terminal was handling 2.4 million TU and capacity was nearly um, 3 million TU. So we put together an expansion program with my partners, 
and we introduced to the Maltese government, and Maltese government was already approved the, uh, the, this investments. If we do it, they will extend because we need to get the return of investment. So today, Malta Free Terminal had an old dredging. It's minimum 17 meter we have draft to accommodate the, today the biggest ship in the world we handle in our terminal. We got the biggest crane in the world with the 25 row outreach to handle this, not today's ships, but the future ships, because the shipyards are keep developing and making innovative ships, so we must be ready for future. Yes. And we changed the uh, infrastructures, and we increased the capacity from 3 million to close to the 4 million to you. Today, Malta Freeport is handling 3.2 two million TUs from 2.4. So the port increased in four years' time, and the 90% of the cargo was only CMA cargoes. Today, 55% of the cargo is CMA. So we opened the port for other third parties and to invite them, and we show them that this port can you know, serve everyone. So this is what the Yield Port is doing Similar thing, we went to Sweden, we went to Norway, we went to Portugal, now in Peru, Ecuador, Turkey. So we are expanding and we are introducing totally different a business model than the traditional or conventional terminal operators. That's so, fantastic. Uh, so so this that's, is, that's this is the innovation we Mis put in the port. To him, I think many of us who want to go into the business of port ownership and operation. But meanwhile, I'd like to take a variation. Please keep your questions. I'd rather have the panelists make their presentation and then we ask them questions at the same time. I'd like to make a variation to what uh, Robert has been talking about by inviting Dr. Raphael, who is in the cruise uh, line business, to talk briefly on that, as well as uh, other innovative uh, vessels like uh, the NLNG, uh, the uh, uh, iron business, and also the, the, the source of power provision to the ports as the ports are changing. Yeah. Dr. Raphael. Thank, thank you very much. Indeed, as, as I mentioned before, we have really innovative ships. So, and what we would like in order to be very efficient regarding the environmental point of view, we need also innovative ports. So what happened from time to time is that we are recycling our waste in 12 or 13 different recycling modes. So when we are coming then to the port reception facilities, so we deliver the 13 different type, uh, types of waste and they put it all together. So what we expect right now from the ports right now that they comply with, with different, uh, different uh, streams. The other thing is what is also important right now is that, that we have at least a dozen new ships coming with LNG, which is important right now that we get the LNG in the ports in order to be able to use the dual fuel engines. We have one member who is using already an LNG engine only on shore. So what happens there is, right, there is coming a, a, a truck, a truck is coming to the ship, and then it is delivering, delivering the LNG and it is working. There's one port, I name it, is in Rotterdam. They are not allowing us to have a truck on board, uh, uh, at the side of the, of the ship in order to, del to deliver delivering the LNG. So this is also important. The other thing is, if there is a possibility about cold ironing or offshore power, so we are more than happy to use it, but this is very difficult and this is very expensive. So there's one cold ironing uh, power station in Hamburg, which cost more or less 13 million euros, was also funded by the EU. But the problem is that the unit, the unit price for electricity is three times more than generating power on, 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 uh, on the ship. So it means right now there has to be some, some subsidies, there has to be some supports in order to use it. Another option, for example, what happened in Hamburg is they have a barge with LNG where they're producing the, the energy on, on this barge and then delivering it as an electricity to the, to the ship. The problem here is they, the, the authorities are not allowing to leave the barge as it is. It has to be they have towed to a tugboat with running engines. So this is also something what is not very efficient. 
So I think this is more or less what we're expecting from ports, and don't, don't, uh, I don't want to take too much time on that one. Thank you. Uh, Mohamed, now when you engage in your ship design, how much of the port in uh, configuration do you take into consideration in the design of the ship themselves? That, that, is, that is also it's a very good question right now, but what you see right now, our ships are getting bigger and bigger right now, so the latest category have more or less 6,500 passengers plus 3,000 3, crew on board, it's more or less 10,000, and what we are finding is that the ports are not, not able to cater these big ships. So, Mohamed, what would be your view on that when you actually do your designs for vessels? How much of the uh, ports uh, configuration do you take into consideration in the design, if any? Uh, of course, when uh, you build a ship of 400 meter length overall and uh, almost 60 meter beam, you have to consider which port those ships are capable to call, to call and which ports are ready to receive such ports. So, in, in China, the, there is uh, three or four ports that can accommodate uh, those ships, Port Kilang. Um, in Europe here, uh, most of the North Europe ports, uh, Hamburg, uh, uh, Antwerp, uh, Rotterdam, uh, ports in UK. So the ports are ready to accommodate such big uh, container ships. But um, the challenge, if the industry goes for uh, a 22,000 EU ship, which, uh, as far as I know, there is one project going on in, in Japan for 21,000 EU ship. Uh, this is means uh, instead of the gantry can go to 22 rows, the gantry can go to 23 rows. So this is a challenge. But uh, go back the, with regard to our projects, yes, we have done a very precise study to, to investigate and analyze which ports can accommodate those ships which uh, in fine about it. Uh, also, we, we have opened a dialogue with uh, certain ports when we decided to make our ships LNG ready. We, we said, okay, we are going to do certain investment and uh, we would like to know when the logistics are ready. So we have opened dialogue with a number of ports and one of them is Rotterdam port. If you go now, if a ship with LNG ready now and needs to bunker LNG. If you go to Rotterdam, you'll get a bunkering, LNG bunkering at Rotterdam. It means, as I said in the morning session, the, the, the LNG logistics is, is moving very fast with compared to three years or four years back. This is a part of, uh, to answer your questions. If you allow me to go to description of uh, what uh, innovation ship if you allow me to go through this. Yes, okay, the okay. club minutes for that. Yeah. Um, the innovation ship uh, it doesn't mean that uh, a nice screen on board the ships, uh, fancy screen with blue and uh, yellow uh, colors. Uh, innovated ships means ship owner will spend money, will, will invest money. And you have to make sure that whatever he will invest, he will get his return. So this, to make your ship innovative, to make your ship following and applying science and technology, you spend money on during the construction of the ship, and it is it is a business case. So you are spending on in, in, in high technological systems uh, like waste heat, waste heat recovery system to make the ship with LNG ready, uh, uh, <clears throat> building a sophisticated cargo system to to, to load actual cargo and not nominal cargo. This is at the end uh, lead to uh, uh, efficient ships, environmental ship, green ship. So it is a win-to-win situation. You, you do your precise uh, preparation prior, prior, submitting your technical specification to the shipyard and uh, ensure that what, what you are going to build, what you are going to uh, put it as technology, it's at, at the end it is pay back to you as a ship owner in better efficiency and better slot cost with compared to the competitor. So this is a very uh, quick and, and brief description on innovative ships. I, I repeat again, it is not uh, screens and computers, it is technology which lead to have a very efficient ships 
and pioneering in, in environmentals and uh, uh, well ahead in, in legislation compl uh, compliance. This is just uh, my view on this innovative ship. Uh, that reminds me of um, when I used to be at sea a very long time ago in the 70s. Um, I was with Shell Tankers UK at the time, and they had um, a fleet of about 104 vessels worldwide. But in the fleet, they had seven purpose-built uh, LNG carriers that were trading between um, Brunei and Osaka. Uh, in Japan, and the, the configuration was such that you have one, boat, one ship in both the loading and discharge port at any moment in time. But what was unique about these ships is that they had the Astan loading platform as against the side loading manifold. So the, the loading platform for the LNGs were on the stern of the ship, and there was an over, overhanging uh, platform on which the manifolds were uh, uh, mounted. But of course that meant that the port, the port design was such as to meet that specific requirement in the design of the LNGs. I wonder if we still have such um, uh, designs of a stand loading and discharge in the LNG trade uh, at the moment, uh, Mohammed? For me. Yes, uh, we, we, we have, uh, as I said, it, uh, it is not uh, just constructing a ship which you keep a supervision team in the shipyard. It is, you have to consider in the, the design of the ship and open a dialogue with uh, many parties, expert parties, which at the end the ship will have to, it, it is part of uh, shipping industry, it integrated in the shipping industry. So uh, when we are talking, uh, uh, I repeat again, a ship of 400 meter and uh, 60 meter beam and air draft of 73 meter, okay? So you have to talk uh, and we are talking and continuous talks with uh, major oil companies in LNG and how to form the bunker supply for, from bunker ship, not bunker barge, in port to uh, such mega container ship. So this was a dialogue open from the day one. We cannot just construct a ship as the, con the, the conservative way to construct ship and uh, the, later on say, okay, let's open the dialogue. It will not work. It is open dialogue and continuous open dialogue with many organization and party in the, in the industry. Thank you. That will bring me to Evangelos. Now, you are in the trade of buying vessels for recycling. Does your decision to buy a particular type of vessel, is it influenced by the ports you can take it to for scrapping or for recycling? It uh, certainly affects uh, to a certain extent uh, the decision of uh, interest basically to purchase or not. Uh, I mean, in principle, uh, we are showing interest in any type of vessel uh, from bulk carriers, containers, tankers, uh, to offshore units like uh, pipe layers, uh, anchor handling uh, units, and so forth. Uh, of course, uh, the size of the unit uh, definitely affects uh, the location that uh, we're going to choose to take over. Uh, because uh, economically it might not be making sense, for example, to take uh, a small uh, um, 2,000 uh, lightweight uh, anchor handling uh, in Singapore and take her, for example, to China or to the Indian subcontinent, whereas a higher vessel, uh, a bigger vessel of, uh, say, for example, 20,000 lightweight, it might uh, uh, well making sense. Um, uh, the ports, uh, from our perspective, are definitely uh, having a detrimental effect on uh, whether uh, we are able to take over uh, to the specific port. Uh, it's not only, of course, uh, local regulations uh, that uh, we have to comply with, whether they allow uh, crew change and uh, ownership to take place, uh, but also uh, there are uh, physical uh, restrictions uh, depending on the voyage and the final destination uh, of uh, each vessel and um, basically uh, affects uh, the decision in the purchasing of, or not. Uh, for example, uh, it has been uh, the case several times, uh, especially on the offshore sector, uh, that we have seen um, uh, rigs in the uh, US region, in the Gulf, 
and uh, basically uh, the, physical, the physical constraints uh, in taking over in a specific port and uh, basically towing or uh, even getting under their own power. Uh, for example, uh, transatlantic voyages um, are making it uh, much more complicated and uh, require uh, basically the uh, involvement of several experts in order to determine if uh, such a uh, decision uh, to purchase uh, should be uh, done or not. At this point, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to come to the audience to know uh, those who may have questions for the panelists, and uh, if you can identify who specifically you want to tackle your question. Audience, please. Where is the microphone? Anybody with a question? That gentleman, please. <coughs> Mr. Moderator, um, I also had this a vision of uh, back to the future listening uh, like you did. In the 70s, at, in Geneva, in Antad, we were negotiating the convention, the UN Convention on Multimodal Transport. And one of the articles that was in that convention that was adopted but never ratified said that because developing countries were suffering premature technological obsolescence in their ports and port equipments, that prior to the introduction of new technologies, consultation shall be held with ports authorities, uh, government authorities, and shippers. My question is, for developing countries, and particularly these developed countries, has the industry lived up to that notion? Thank you. Okay. I would like to invite uh, Robert, who has a very vast experience developing ports in different parts of the world, to... I agree. Um, developed countries, they put their infrastructure investment 30, 40 years ago, and since then, they never upgraded except to Europe. So, for example, I'm looking at the ports in the United States, and I'm looking at the ports in the Europe and the Asia, mainly the uh, Far East. So there's a big gap. So USA ports are today 20, 30 years behind Europe and Asia. And it is a shame. And you can see that this difference even in the airports today. You go to US, many airports are old, not well maintained. So, yes, incentive, I mean, the uh, intensive investment needed, like in the developed countries. I go to Sweden, ports are old. Norway, same. Malta, since we came, we are upgrading. Port is the one of the advanced port today in Europe. Even the Malta is a less than half million people lives, very small economy. But the Malta Free Port, today, one of the best ports, not only in Europe, but in the world. So, depends who owns and who operates this terminal. The governments built and they left to the port authorities. Port authorities do not care. They don't want to put too much money. They waste the money. So I believe privatization must happen in the infrastructure side. And the private companies own and they should do the appropriate investment to accommodate for future, because if we don't build the infrastructure for future, the cost of living will increase, because all the goods today carried mainly, mainly by the sea, by the ships. And ships are expensive investments, like Mohammed says, they put several hundred millions of dollars, billions of dollars you're putting in the ships, and then infrastructure is not able to accommodate. So if government cannot do it, let the private entities to do it. So open the doors and encourage them. And the developed countries suffering from that side, but the developing countries to 
close the gap, they're inviting a lot of investors like on the PPP models or uh, BOT models, this type of things, because they don't have money, but they know that people who has money and they're running after the investment to make money. So now I see the developing or the emerging countries are welcoming more the investor than the developed countries. You cannot go to US today, you say, I have billion dollars, I wanna build a port, impossible, no way. But you go Africa, you go Latin America, everybody will put a red carpet in front of you, please come and build this thing. So Thank this you, Robert. Um, can we take uh, more questions from the audience? We still have a few minutes. Yes, anybody from this side? I see a hand up there. Surely, this session wasn't that boring. <laughs> okay, if you're not going to ask any questions, I'm gonna ask you questions. So we're gonna take the, uh, the, well now, from what we've heard today, does anybody in the audience think there could be a legislation that can help merge the uh, ports, development, and designs with the innovative ships? Anybody who can answer that question, I'll pay your hotel room for today. I'm sure Robert will support me there. Yes, who is smart to answer that? Where is uh, Peter? He's a guru on ports, on uh, uh, IMO regulations and legislation. Okay, uh, finally, before we uh, wrap up, I want to ask Francesco, if you had the opportunity of going back to run the port of Naples, is there anything you would do differently with respect to the ports and the innovative ships? Well, uh, it's a very challenging question. I think only stupid people would do uh, things differently. Probably, I, I couldn't think of anything in particular. Uh, I want to tell you a story. In uh, 1998, there was the first trip of a new catamaran line between Naples and Sicily, Palermo. And uh, one of the two shareholders was Mr. Gianluigi Aponte of MSC. Uh, and uh, at that time I was uh, visiting various ports. The port of Naples is an old port with parallel pier. And obviously I wanted to uh, fill the gaps of the keys between the piers and, uh, you know, build a wall to make a container terminal. Uh, and uh, at that time, they were the largest uh, vessel of the time of 7,000 tiers by Merck. And I asked Mr. Aponte, who is a genius, because he made from one vessel, you know, 500 vessel fleet. And so what, what do you think if, if this 7,000 vessel will take place? Obviously, Naples is not a hub port, but, you know, we may have some hub. And, and he said, no, 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 absolutely, 5,000, 5,500. Now Mr. Aponte is building a lot of uh, around uh, 20,000 <laughs> tier vessels. So I, I think that uh, human intelligence, uh, clever people are sometimes more clever to adapt than to be able to predict uh, what is going to happen in the future. I was listening to my other friends here, in particular to Mr. Ildrin, who took advantage from his academic study, studies and engineering, but he had to cope with change in the situations. I think what we have to have in mind is always to find uh, flexible solutions that respect the land, the cities, in particular if we are talking about uh, harbor in, in, the, in these places but they also take into account that the change in the industry, even if you have the long side vision, you cannot predict them. So 
If I may give a suggestion to myself, I don't think I will run a port uh, anymore because I cannot afford earning uh, one twentieth of my <laughs> my professional earnings to be a civil servant, unfortunately. But uh, to the young people who are doing this job or less young, is uh, l let's be flexible. And I think a big terminal operator or cruise or association industry or recycling or an expert of new project on uh, vessels, as Mrs. Zaitun, and, uh, you know, could probably, could probably confirm this advice. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Raphael, would you like to give a, have a last word on this, please? Yeah, it's a, it's a, <clears throat> yes, thank you very much. And, and indeed, what is for us is really important, also the dialogue. So if we are talking together with the ports right now, saying what is the best way in order to cater our, our needs and what we can do in order to, to, pro to promote the business and what is the best way to comply with all the environmental standards. Thank you. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to invite you to appreciate uh, Robert, Raphael, uh, Mohamed, Evangelos, and Francesco with a slight applause. Please.